Hi, I'm Nels Matson, a CPA with Kirkring Barbaria, and we've put together a presentation covering areas of the coronavirus stimulus packages that we've been getting the most questions about. And I'd like to start with a high level look at the packages. So there are three acts that were passed within this last month in March. The first of these was the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act. This was signed into law on March 6th. And it provides $8.3 billion in emergency funding for federal agencies to respond to coronavirus. Of these, $7 billion is in disaster loans to small businesses that is offered by the SBA. The second act was the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. This was signed into law on March 18th and is designed to provide assistance to employees and households affected by COVID-19. The third act is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, also known as the CARES Act. This was signed into law this past Friday, March 27th. And it contains many elements to aid small businesses. Among these are the Small Business Paycheck Protection Program, also known as the PPP. And there are many business tax provisions and as well as stimulus payments for individuals and unemployment assistance. In these three acts, there are loans and credits that are available for immediate use to small businesses. There are two small business loans, the federal, uh, the emergency idle, which is a federal disaster loan, and the Small Business Paycheck Protection Program loan, also known as the PPP or a 7A loan. There are also employer tax credits and paid sick and family leave credits. So what is the emergency idle, also known as the 7B2 loan program? It is an SBA, a small business association loan for disaster relief that was initially funded in the first act. And additional funds were, uh, were put forth in the CARES Act and also some adjustments were also put in place in the CARES Act. So who is, a, who is eligible for the emergency idle? Uh, businesses with full-time equivalent employees of 500 or, or under 500 are eligible. And the amount of this loan is up to $2 million, but is limited to the economic injury of the business that is determined by the small business administration. How can the proceeds of the emergency idle loan be used? Uh, they can be used for working capital of the business. So this is a little more versatile than the 7A or the PPP loans that I'll talk about later. Uh, so, so that's one of the, the big benefits of the emergency idle. Uh, the interest rates and terms, the maximum interest rate for for-profit businesses is 3.75%. And for nonprofit, the maximum rate is 2.75% with a term of up to 30 years. Uh, is collateral required? The nice part about uh, the, the changes that came forth in the CARES Act is that it increased collateral or a business owner personal guarantee from $25,000 to $200,000. So this also um, will increase uh, the speed of the loan process. Uh, where do you apply for this emergency idle? You can apply for this directly on the Small Business Administration website. Another really important part of the emergency idle is you have this opportunity to uh, apply for an advance of $10,000 uh, that's paid in within, in their, they're saying it's being paid within 36 hours. So it, it's allowed for the same uses as, as the rest of the loan. A big part of this though, is that you, there is no repayment required for this $10,000. And even if your emergency idle application is denied, uh, repayment is still not required for this uh, advance. 
So now I'm going into the Paycheck Protection Program. And this, this is where we've probably been getting the most questions. Um, so what is the Paycheck Protection Program or the PPP, or you probably heard it called the SBA 7A loan as well. So what is it? It's an, a small business administration loan with a streamlined process in which all or portions may be forgiven under a loan forgiveness program. So who is eligible for this loan? Uh, businesses with fewer than 500 full-time equivalent employees. Uh, it's expanded, so sole proprietors are eligible. Businesses with NAIC code beginning with 72, which uh, that includes food services and accommodation. So for these businesses, it's uh, the 500 is measured by location. So if there's less than 500 per location, then they are eligible. Uh, franchises are eligible that were assigned a franchise ID code by the SBA. And the business had to have been in operation before February 15th of 2020 and have had employees and or independent contractors who were paid. Um, one part of the uh, application is that you do have to certify that your business um, had have, has had economic conditions that make this uh, loan application and make make these proceeds necessary for your business. So what what is the maximum amount that you can borrow under the Paycheck Protection Program? So the maximum amount is the lesser of ten million dollars or two and a half times the average monthly payroll cost that were incurred during the year before the loan origination date and the amount that was taken for the idol that we talked about earlier that uh, was refinanced into this loan. So um, what are payroll costs um, that go into this calculation? So the things that you'll include for your payroll costs are salaries, wages, commissions, and other compensation, cash tips or equivalents. You'll include payments for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, dismissal or separation allowance. Uh, also included are group health care benefits, including insurance premiums, payment of retirement benefits, and state or local taxes on employee compensation. So those are all included in payroll costs for purpose of this calculation. What is not included, what's excluded? Um, compensation of an annual salary that is greater than $100,000 prorated from February 15th to June 30th, 2020. So, um, so the monthly amounts that are prorated would be, so like $8,333. Anything over that per month would be excluded. Um, payroll taxes and income taxes are excluded. Compensation of employees that their principal residence is outside the United States are excluded. And qualified sick leave wages where credit was taken under the, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, those will also be excluded. So what is the application? Oh, and also I, I don't want to forget our sole proprietors. Um, what what is included for their payroll costs, it will be the payment of compensation or income that is a wage, commission, net earnings from self-employment, or similar compensation uh, that is less than $100,000. So that will be included in payroll costs for sole proprietors. Um, the application uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program for the PPP is through a private a uh, private lender that's qualified by the SBA. So how does the loan forgiveness portion of this work? The following uh, that are forgiven, the following that are paid in the eight weeks uh, period following the origination of the loan, uh, payments for these costs will be forgiven. So for payroll costs, uh, meaning the same definition that we just defined, um, interest, on covered mortgage obligations will be forgiven, rent on covered lease obligations, and covered utility 
programs. And covered just means uh, during that during that eight week period. Loan forgiveness can be reduced by either a reduction in um, of 25% employee salaries, and that's only for those that are um, that are under $100,000 annualized, or a reduction in number of full-time equivalent employees. And there is no reduction in forgiveness if salaries are increased or employment is restored by June 30th, 2020. So what documentation is necessary to provide a lender for forgiveness? So, so these are things that you'll uh, want to make sure that you, ha you have to provide your, your lender. You'll need to provide them with the payroll tax filings uh, so that you can verify the number of employees and pay rates. Uh, canceled checks will be and, and receipts to verify payments of mortgage payments, rent, and uh, also your utility payments. And another uh, really important part of this is the forgiveness of the PPP loan is not taxable. So uh, credit that is available under the CARES Act is the employee retention credit. And so what is this? It's uh, a credit that an employer can take against employment taxes of up to 50% of qualified wages to each employee, up to $10,000 per employee. And the business had to have been in operation during 2020 to be able to take advantage of this credit. So what period does this cover? You'll be able, a business will be able to start taking this credit once the gross receipts fall 50% below the previous year's quarter. Or, and then it, it will go until uh, the gross receipts reach 80% of the previous year's quarter. So if you're taking advantage of the PPP loan, uh, you will not be able to also take advantage of this credit. So that's, or if you're taking um, advantage of the paid family and medical leave credits that I'll mention next, you will not be able to take advantage of, the, of this credit either. So that's something to keep in mind. So uh, the tax credits that are for paid sick leave and family and medical leave, um, what are they? What is the credit for paid sick leave? It is for 100% of qualified sick leave wages taken between April 1st and December 31st, 2020. So note that this doesn't start until uh, uh, for wages until tomorrow. The credit cannot exceed $200 per day per individual, and it's limited to 10 days. For those with COVID-19 or experiencing symptoms, the credit is $511 per day. What is the credit for paid family and medical leave? The credit for this is 100% of qualified family leave wages that, is, that are taken between April 1st and December 31st, 2020. And, and the leave has to be related to COVID-19. Um, credit is limited to $200 per day per individual, and it is also limited to 10 days. So some other items to consider when you're thinking about individual cash flow, or maybe your employee's cash flow, is uh, there will be, and there was a provision that uh, put in place individual stimulus payments in the CARES Act. So there will be $1,200 that will be passed out. Uh, so th these payments will be passed out within the next three weeks is what is what we're hearing and they'll either be sent through direct deposit if uh if tax were tax taxes were refunded through direct deposit last year or they'll be mailed out uh in a check so there will be twelve hundred dollars for individuals beginning uh phase out at seventy five thousand uh, dollars for your adjusted gross income for married filing joint it'll uh will receive $2,400 uh, for, for those making that had under $150,000 of adjusted gross income. And so it will phase out after this $150,000. And then there's additional $500 that will be uh, paid out per child. Another thing to keep in mind 
um, are the unemployment provisions that are in the CARES Act. These are expanded to unemployment. Uh, these expand unemployment to self-employed individuals or those uh, that wouldn't have sufficient work history to qualify under state law. Those who are current, who currently qualify for under, unemployment under state law may also qualify for an additional $600 per week. Future topics that we can discuss in upcoming webinars are temporary relief of net operating loss limitations, an increase in the business interest deduction, bonus depreciation, temporary relief of 401k and 403b withdrawal penalties for those with COVID-19 or affected by COVID-19, charitable contributions, and we can also discuss further on the PPP loan forgiveness and more depending on your interest. Hi, my name is Jonna Kennedy Preston. I'm the healthcare business consultant with Kirkring Barbario. And this morning, we're gonna to talk to you about a couple of um, things that directly um, impact healthcare providers. One of which is CMS's decision to um, allow for accelerated and advanced uh, payments during this um, pandemic. So CMS is authorized to provide accelerated or advanced payments to healthcare providers in times of emergency, which of course during this pandemic, um, that is what this is considered. Uh, what this allows them to do is provide for cash flow options for healthcare providers in, impacted during these times. So the eligibility requirement um, for applying for the accelerated payments is number one, the provider or supplier has to have billed Medicare for claims within the past 180 days prior to um, the date of signature on the request form that will need to be completed. Also, the provider or supplier cannot be in any bankruptcy, cannot be under any active medical review or program integrity investigation, and cannot have had any outstanding delinquent Medicare overpayment in order to qualify. The amount of the uh, payment for most providers um, will be 100% of Medicare payments for the previous, uh, for, for any, for a three month period of time. Um, there are special considerations for inpatient um, acute care hospitals and children hospitals, but for the most part, most providers and suppliers would be eligible for up to 100% of um, what they had previously um, billed Medicare for. The processing time, each MAC will work to review and issue payments within seven calendar days of receiving the request. Um, the repayment, uh, CMS has extended the repayment of these accelerated or advanced payments to begin about 120 days after the date of issue, issuing the uh, payments to the provider or su supplier. The form that's needed um, to request the advanced payments, you can find um, on the MAX website. And for um, us here in Florida, that would be first post service option. The repayment timeline is broken out by provider type. Um, there is one for inpatient uh, acute care hospitals versus all other Part A and Part B um, providers and suppliers. Um, that would have uh, 210 days from the accelerated um, payment date. And again, this just kind of goes through the difference. Um, first bullet being, you know, most of what this audience um, will be, which are just provider suppliers versus um, hospitals and um, other Part A type providers for skilled nursing facilities, et cetera. That goes through the detail of um, what the MAC will do um, in order to recoup uh, and reconcile. So that's a, an overview of the accelerated payment program. Um, and just for those who have not already decided to set up a Medicare telehealth services in this time when we've got reduced set staff and patients wanting to not have to come into the actual office 
and have opted instead for telehealth services. Medicare has, um, again, in this uh, critical time, lightened um, the requirements for doing um, and providing telehealth services. They've taken away the restrictions of um, the place of service settings in which um, were previously um, part of them paying for telehealth services. So effective March 6th, they listed um, all of those restrictions and now um, Medicare will pay um, basically in pretty much any setting, whether that be physician office, patient home, um, et cetera. Um, so again, that is um, starting March 6th due to COVID-19. They are um, paid at the same rate as a regular um, in-person visit for um, the actual real telehealth services. Um, the check-in services um, and, and uh, e-visits are a little bit um, different, and you can check the First Post website for what those um, allowable payments are. But Medicare telehealth visits, um, again, effective March 6th, are due to um, COVID-19, are available and can be furnished to any benef beneficiary in any healthcare facility and in their home. Um, Coinsurance and deductibles will apply. We, we've got a couple of different kinds of visits. Um, we've got virtual uh, check-in visits, which can really just be done over the phone. Um, and, and these are just basically checking in. Um, there are criteria for billing these two codes, um, the two codes being G2012 and 2010. Um, the 212 is for the actual virtual check-in, which would be five to 10 minutes of medical discussion between the practitioner and um, the patient regarding something other than um, a patient uh, condition with, that had been with, um, at a visit within the past, previous uh, seven days, um, and a condition that would not lead them to come in for a visit um, for the next 24 hours post virtual check-in visit. The G2010 is the remote evaluation of captured video or images sent to a provider. So if a patient sends uh, electronically to a provider a picture of something that they want um, the provider to review, that would be the appropriate code to bill. Then there are Medicare e-visits. Um, e-visits um, are patient-initiated online evaluation and management that are typically conducted via a patient portal. And those three codes are um, 99421, 22, and 23, depending upon the number of minutes spent. Um, and the same condition for, um, it, it does have conditions for up to seven days of cumulative time. So that five to 10 minutes can happen over a seven day period of time. There are also um, co specific codes for um, what they non physician visits. Um, so, for example, physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, versus the previous codes, which would be physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants. There are these specific G codes available for those non physician healthcare professionals to do online assessments as well. Then the true Medicare telehealth visits, those are billed um, depending on what you're providing, um, the new or established patient office visits, code 99201 through 99215, same documentation requirements as normal. It's just that it would be done uh, over some electronic form versus face-to-face -face in the office. Um, for uh, telehealth consultations um, for emergency departments or initial inpatient. Those are the two G codes or the uh, G code series G0425 to G0427. And then follow up for um, 
inpatient telehealth consult um, in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility. Those would be the G0406 to G0408. And then the last slide was just a summary of what we've just um, reviewed, which is basically the three types of Medicare tele, uh, telemedicine services that are available for use. Um, first, showing the, the typical common telehealth services, which is the, the new and established patient visit. Um, the second, the virtual check-in and the actual e-visit, those both have to be already established patients. Um, and so again, just a recap of the codes that are available for use. So if you haven't already um, set up a Medicare telemedicine um, service for your patients, hopefully this will give you some guidance as to um, appropriate um, billing for such services. Well, thank you for your time and stay well. Hi, this is Kathy Hargraves, and I'm a shareholder with Kirkreen Barbario. I'm in charge of the Healthcare Advisory Services team. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to build on what Nels and Jana just said to help you to figure out how to tap into the various funding sources that are available to you. The very first thing that you need to do with your management team or your accounting uh, team is to figure out what your monthly cash flow is going to look like for the next four months. Base this on your estimated volume drop and then the predicted recovery curve. I do not want you to consider any loans in this first step. You need to make sure that you correctly assess your staffing and your supply needs and any other expense that will be diminished because your volume is dropped. Once you have that done, next I want you to calculate the amount of the PPP Section 7A funding that Nels talked about earlier. This is the first stat source of uh, funding that you're going to want to tap into. Once you've done that, you want to figure out how much is going to be forgiven. The reason you want to do that is you need to plan to see exactly how you're going to spend the money. And remember, there are some specific rules that you need to follow in order to maximize the forgiveness component. And we can help you with that piece as well. Then consider the other sources of funding, including the advanced Medicare funding that Jana discussed. Plug this into your cash flow. If you think it, you're still going to be cash negative, then you may want to apply for the SBA disaster loan. Remember that you cannot spend the money for the PPP forgiveness component on the same items that you are going to fund through the SBA disaster loan. And by the way, we recommend that you get a separate bank account for each of these loan funding sources in order to track them. This is a complex process. It needs to be well thought out, but the money is there to help you to get through these tough times. Thank you so much for joining. We are here to help. Be well. And remember, if you need anything from our Kirkering team, please call us. Thank you.